Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Professor Grabowska, for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, I hope um, I will be done in around 45, 50 minutes. And then I would uh, very much be happy to be grilled a little bit. So if you have any questions or suggestions or afterthoughts uh, or any kinds of conclusions that you would like to share uh, with the room, uh, uh, please do. First of all, the presentation is available online, so if you would like to uh, upload the slides and uh, see uh, them once again, you go to uh, Google uh, with a dot in the middle, XJMTA, XJMTA2, and you can upload the slides and see them uh, uh, for your own purposes. Okay, this is the outline of uh, my today's talk. Um, I will uh, give you a very brief introduction of uh, theory of scientific revolutions. Um, so a kind of a guiding theme, uh, which will be then leading us through the lecture. And then I will talk a little bit about behavior change intervention science. I am health psychologist. So my main area of interest and research and applications refers to health behavior change. So helping people or testing and investigating how to change your physical activity, your nutrition behavior, your smoking, alcohol intake, um, uh, doing any kind of cancer screening um, uh, actions or participating in any cancer screening actions. So this is my area of expertise. Therefore, the main examples that I will provide will refer to this area, of course. But I would like to stress that, well, at least I think very strongly, I, I, I'm very, I strongly believe that those issues that I will discuss are kind of a very general issues that you can also translate to your area of expertise, to your area of studies, and to your area of future work. So I will be talking about our normal science, how well are we doing in our research. We are so good, uh, we are doing well. Well, there are some anomalies. What are these anomalies? Why should we take them into account or pay some more attention to them? And I will talk about the crisis in science and the call for a new paradigm. And finally, about revolutions which may be required. And I do very strongly believe that for social and humanity, uh, humanities uh, to make a real contribution to the uh, current developments in the world and to the modern society, we really need to change uh, the way we do our science. And uh, I will present today one of the options how you could change your science in a way to make it making stronger stronger impact. Okay. So, first of all, to increase the impact, uh, probably I will not surprise you, we need a theory. And uh, one of the very good examples of such a theories that you can use to increase the impact is a theory which is called uh, a theory of the revolutions in science. It has been developed by Thomas Kuhn, uh, around 50 years ago. Uh, this is a philosopher of science um, who was acting in the United States. And I think for philosophy, he's quite modern because uh, he's only, uh, his main research was done around 50 years ago. But it's very, very pronounced and very well known in the world of philosophy of science. So this is something that could be um, uh, a canvas for your thinking about how to make the revolution in your area, in your um, discipline. One of the readings that I would like to suggest would be probably not the original Kuhn's work, but uh, a number of essays, uh, a book which is actually including a bunch of essays published last year, as you see. The ebook is only 10 uh, US dollars, so it's not very expensive. And you can read about how the theory of revolutions in science was used in various disciplines. So this is a kind of a very interesting reading. 
The good theory has uh, several attributes. One of them is it's very simple. So this is actually the theory that Thomas Kuhn presented. Um, if you would like to change the science in a way that it makes a larger impact, you go through four stages. The first is so-called normal science. Then you observe the anomalies. Then you go through a stage which is called crisis. And finally, you go to the revolution, changing uh, your science completely, at least uh, a little bit, but in, in a sufficient way to make a real new contribution. Briefly about all four stages, uh, stages of uh, scientific revolutions. So what is the normal science? Normal science is something that most of us are doing on a daily basis in terms of our research and in terms of our um, teaching. So we have our established paradigms. Let's say we are doing experiments, we are doing focus groups, uh, so we are using certain methods, we use certain methods to analyze that, we use certain theories to uh, choose um, uh, the solution for the problem that we are undertaking. And then what is going on is a cumulative scientific progress uh, is emerging. So we are adding small blocks we are adding or searching for small holes uh, in our uh, uh, scientific evidence, and we try to solve the puzzle, putting our small piece that it matches the current, current paradigms. So this is a kind of a um, normal science that we engage in. Then the next stage in a scientific revolution is called a stage of anomalies. We are starting to observe but there are more and more uh, accumulating anomalies. So, for example, from my area, uh, well, there are plenty of interventions, uh, psychosocial intervention targeting the change of body weight. However, uh, when you do a good systematic review, it turns out that they are not effective. So, we are doing something wrong, right? Uh, that means that, well, there must be some inadequacy uh, in the methods that we are using, or in paradigms or approaches that, you are, what, that we are using to explain this ph phenomenon. We are doing something wrong. The next stage is called crisis. So crisis is a stage when we are more and more thinking about anomalies, and we do believe that our dominant approach, our dominant paradigm cannot solve these anomalies. So our approaches are not sufficient, and we lose our confidence in ruling paradigms. So this is the moment where you have a call for a new paradigm. Kuhl has coined the term which is called the paradigm shift. So the, cult, uh, the uh, scientific revolution takes place where you move the paradigm uh, or you discover a new paradigm and use them to explain uh, your problems. So this is a revision of discipline because you search for a new dominant paradigm, allowing for elimination of most pressing anomalies. What is very, very relevant, I think, in Kuhn's writing and uh, his followers' writing as well. The choice of a new paradigm and the backbone of the new paradigm is the social and policy factor. So President Trump is relevant because what he's doing should be also to some degree reflected I, or will be reflected to some degree in policies, including health policies. Therefore, what I am doing should be to, set, to some degree in concordance or in discussion or in reference to what he will be doing. The same refers to our current government. Okay, so I go to the examples uh, in the area of uh, health psychology, explaining the four stages of scientific revolutions. And the way, as I said, I do strongly believe social and humanities should actually go towards a bit more, think a bit more in line with certain new uh, paradigms. Okay, so what is the normal science of uh, behavior change uh, interventions? I do remind you that normal science is established, par uh, the paradigms are established, and uh, cumulative st scientific progress is um, uh, achieved via uh, puzzle-solving activities. Okay, 
We are doing pretty well in health sciences, identifying health behaviors which are relevant uh, for well-being of individuals and which needs change. For example, this is, an exa this is an example of accumulating evidence which is showing that, well, uh, engaging in four behaviors, four health behaviors, including smoking, fruit and vegetable consumption, alcohol intake, and physical activity, makes a difference on average in your life, estimated lifetime. And this difference is, sorry, where is it? 14 years. Okay, it's here. It's 14 years. So people who engage in all four of these behaviors live on average 14 years longer, 14 years longer, than those uh, who engage only uh, in one of these behaviors on a regular basis. So we know that this is truly important for the well-being of the society and individual. And this is uh, evidence gathered from plenty of uh, very strong studies in terms of their design. We are also doing well inventing uh, new health behaviors uh, which require change. So for example, one of the behaviors which is gaining um, Attraction uh, is sitting, so if you haven't heard it yet, sitting is the new smoking. This is new killer which will probably reduce your quality of life, your well-being and uh, your life expectancy. Um, okay, uh, we have quite a lot of evidence already, so we know that those of you who sit at least seven hours per day, seven hours per day of sitting, most of us unfortunately do it. And if you increase your sitting for one hour, so you become sitting for eight hours per day, well, unfortunately, your risk of morbidity uh, and mortality increases. And this increase is similar to the increase which is um, explained by uh, a lack of physical activity or obesity. So, in other words, uh, being obese uh, is, or being sedentary and sitting for eight or more hours per day uh, gives you a similar increased risk of morbidity and mortality. So this is very relevant for your health, actually. If you are interested in our behaviors that health psychology are currently working on to find out, well, one of the recent is, for example, um, what is the main source of germs in your kitchen? What is the nastiest, dirtiest place or thing in your kitchen? It's a kitchen cloth that you use to clean your dishes uh, or to dry your dishes. And uh, how can you actually uh, reduce the number of germs at your uh, cloth which you use to dry the dishes? What is the easiest thing? <laughs> Well, okay, but sometimes you have to use it. That's a very useful thing in the kitchen, so it's difficult to eliminate it completely. You put it into microwave and microwave it for 30 seconds. That's enough to actually kill all the germs. Of course, it shouldn't be plastic cloth. It should be linen or cotton or something else that you can actually put into microwave. So this is one of the ways to reduce your exposure to different kinds of germs and viruses. You can do it starting from the top. Good luck. Okay, we are doing quite well uh, trying to um, uh, accumulate the evidence which shows that, well, some of the interventions that psychologists and social scientists are developing are working quite okay. So we have more and more so-called accumulating evidence. So evidence which is gathered in systematic reviews and applied systematically and shows whether there are stable trends across the research which would provide the evidence, yes, the effect is there. So this is, for example, such a uh, uh, systematic review which shows that psychosocial interventions which are aiming at prevention of um, uh, excessive gains during the pregnancy are relatively successful. So women who take part in these interventions weight at the end of pregnancy 1.25 kilos less. This is maybe not very much, but this is already some. For each women, 1.2 kilogram less is something, almost for every woman. Okay, sorry. We are doing well searching for new constructs, so new psychological constructs which could explain our 
uh, target person's behavior uh, or well-being better. Uh, we are doing quite well linking those constructs and saying, well, this is the mechanism through which this construct operates. So this is how they are linked, and through those links, they actually explain the behavior change, for example, or way being. And we are doing quite well combining those mechanisms into nice theories, right? So showing how actually all of them can be combined into a nice picture, which can be uh, better explaining the reality. Um, using the theories, we are doing quite well uh, doing nice research, of course, and uh, presenting how the interventions that we develop. So this is an example of our study from our group, which showed uh, that if you compare um, three types of intervention, one is targeting self-efficacy beliefs, beliefs about ability to um, deal with the barriers that arise, with a planning intervention, uh, so the intervention that helps you to uh, design your future in terms of where, when, and how some action will take place, compared to the control group operates. So uh, we are doing quite well showing that, for example, those interventions do not only have an impact on some relevant outcomes, such as body fat tissue percentage, but they operate through certain mediating mechanisms. So. It's not only that we know the effect is there, but we also know how this effect is actually evoked. Um, okay, we are doing quite well, uh, already identifying how to make the interventions a bit easier for the users of the intervention. So again, we have a number of systematic reviews which are showing, uh, for example, what could secure a better learnability of this intervention or a better memorability of this material that you are providing to your um, target group. Um, okay, and we are doing quite well also when we try to uh, develop certain uh, frameworks which could help us report what we are doing better in a way that it can be very well replicated across the settings, across the words. So this is one of such frameworks uh, which allows you or forces you, I would even say, uh, to provide very, very detailed information about the procedures that you are using to obtain the effect uh, of your intervention or any kind of action that you are doing. Okay. So, uh, summing up, the normal science. Uh, which is a cumulative uh, scientific progress achieved by establishing, um, by using established paradigms. And our, in other words, bread and butter of behavior change interventions shows us that, well, uh, we know quite a lot about effects of interventions on selected outcomes. We are able to identify more and more relevant constructs and mechanisms and combine them into the theories which are usable for interventions. Uh, we know a bit more about the useful uh, intervention um, uh, behavior change um, techniques, and we are uh, developing better criteria, checklists for planning, reporting, and delivering these interventions. Okay, well, since I'm a health psychologist, when saying, well, bread and butter is not very nice, I think I should replace it, for example, with uh, fruit and vegetable of behavior change interventions. So, not to prime you to bread and butter, but rather prime you to fruit and vegetable, fruit and vegetable. Okay. So, I can say we are pretty satisfied with what we are doing, right? We have more and more research, more constructs, a little bit of accumulating evidence, a little bit of uh, solving, uh, puzzle solving activities. Well, is it so good that we are actually not in the need of any major developments in science? Okay, well, let's look into some details. For example, uh, if you look into the reviews on, of randomized control trials on, uh, of brief interventions which target the change of fruit and vegetable intake, then these reviews will show you that, for example, the change, the average change of behavior across the interventions would equal half an apple. 
half an apple. Is half an apple or half a fruit a lot per day or not? Is it a major change in the behavior? Is it relevant for any kind of outcome, like well-being or health? Are we really doing okay? This is a significant effect, of course, right? Well, one of the ways to look into the details is, for example, translate it into something that um, uh, economy calls um, uh, living more years of better quality, so the quali outcome, right? Does eating half a portion of a fruit would really give our target group more years of better quality? So, would they live at least half a year longer and this year, half a year longer will be uh, of nice quality. Well, unfortunately not. So the economists will actually find out that half an apple a day on average equals minus 0.32 years. So there is no change, right? Let's forget about this minus which is here, but it is there. Uh, then I go to the major stakeholders. So for example, the policy makers who uh, Ministry of Health or the local government and say, well, you know, I have a very nice intervention for kids. I think it will be interesting and they will eat more fruits and the effects are significant. We know it from our research. Well, if the policymaker is good, they will say, well, have you estimated whether it really translates into a relevant outcome? And I have to say, well, unfortunately, the kids will live um, 0.3 years shorter after my intervention. Right? If the policymaker is smart, there will be no uptake of what I'm doing. Our own research, we are looking for long-term effect of uh, pretty complex interventions on a major outcome. So such a major outcomes as body mass index, right? Not only whether we, we eat half a fruit a day, well, the body mass index change is something relevant. So let's look whether our interventions do actually change uh, the body weight. Uh, uh, including body mass index. Well, not really. No significant effect of various interventions compared to the control group. Um, well, if you look into systematic reviews, they will show you whether actually the effect is there, but it will be only after the intervention was completed. If you look into longer term effects, for example, six months later or one year later, then the effects are usually dissolved, right? So, well, yes, there are significant effects, but these are usually observed directly after you have finished your actions. So there is no sustain sustainability of your effect. You say goodbye to your participants, and they say goodbye to any outcome change, actually. Uh, uh, Mental health uh, and physical health uh, e-based interventions. So interventions which use IT technology to deliver uh, uh, their, uh, uh, their, effect, their, their procedures. Well, it turns out that the effects may be there, but they are very small. So again, they are so small that they might be actually clinically uh, irrelevant. Now we sometimes think, okay, maybe we are doing something wrong. Maybe we have to combine some of the things that produce the small effect, and then we have a larger effect, right, after the combination. So we use two different categories of, um, uh, of our intervention and combine them into one. Well, one and one should be two, so the effects should be larger. This is one of our nice studies, which shows that one and one still equals one. So if there is any change, the change in a combined uh, uh, intervention group is actually the same as the change uh, in the groups which have only one component of the intervention. So the combination doesn't work. It's not the way to improve the effectiveness of intervention. Well, some reviews actually show that it's the best if we quit some psychological um, uh, uh, manipulation. So, for example, this is one of the reviews recently published, which is showing that all well, the largest effects of interventions are there if there is no strategy such as barrier identification and problem solving uh, or providing normative information. So, we know what not to do. 
for example, but we still don't know what to do to achieve a larger effect. Then, some other strange problems are arising. For example, we sometimes have research in which very strange things happen. So we are following people for a long time uh, with our intervention, and what we usually expect is that some people will drop out. They will find the intervention not feasible for them, not su suiting their needs, etc., etc. But sometimes we have like intervention like this. There are no dropouts, only we have some people who died over the course of the treatment and the follow-up measures, but nobody has resigned or quit the intervention or any measurements. What happened? How did we achieve it? How did we achieve it? Uh, almost nobody is working towards explaining those things. So there are more and more anomalies. Summing up, uh, the effects of behavior change interventions do not translate into more years of better quality, so we do not achieve a major change in major outcome. Long-term maintenance of our um, interventions or our psychological actions are usually very short, and it's difficult to see anything which works over one year, for over one year after being completed. Combining components, nicely based on nicely theories that we are using, does not translate into better effects, so one and one, often equal still one. And uh, sometimes the things which are addressed to the same population and use similar techniques or similar constructs achieve huge dropouts and others uh, do achieve no dropouts. How can it be explained? So we can explain all of those things using our paradigms. So for example, well, if this uh, small behavior change uh, does not translate into more years of better quality, well, I can think, okay, I will use other theories from health behavior change area. Maybe there is some problem in measurement or power. So I'm translating into current paradigms that I'm using. Same can be done with the poor maintenance effect. Well, I can say, well, maybe it was too little boosters, so I provided inter interventions on too few occasions. I should increase the number of occasions, deliver it more often or for a longer time. Or maybe there are some moderators, so it works only for women but not for men. I will search it for that. Uh, this is, again, using the paradigm that is existing. Or, uh, well, if I'm thinking about combining theory-based components which do not translate into larger effects, well, I can think about combining other behavior change techniques, for example, so not only uh, theories, but also the mechanism or the ways of delivery. So I can still use the same paradigms to sort these issues out. The problem is, well, is it really enough? And this is a question that I cannot answer, but it's certainly the question that you should actually uh, think about before planning the next study. Will using the paradigm that you are currently using be enough to solve this problem in a way which will, in the long run, secure existence of social sciences and humanities. Not only offer you PhD, but give something more. Okay. If you are sharing my concern that what we are doing is not enough, then we are in a crisis stage, and we are in a stage uh, which is a call for a new paradigm. Let, let's seek for other alternative approaches which should or could help us deliver something which is more feasible for the current society, for the modern society, which is more convincing for our partners from the other disciplines, for example, and which can secure that our target groups, whoever they are, are more satisfied with what we deliver. Okay. Um, I think psychology in general, many uh, social sciences, are actually located into the science quadrant, which is called Pasteur quadrant. Many sciences, uh, many disciplines in science are uh, divided into three quadrants, and two basic quadrants are those two. One is called pure research, that's its Borg quadrant, and the other is called applied research, and it's called Edison quadrant. So this is science which is stimulated here clearly by thought and the concept, and here by the current needs of uh, the world or society. And uh, health psychology for sure, uh, many areas within psychology 
many areas within various social sciences are located in so-called used-inspired basic research. So we are still doing basic research, but they are clearly used-inspired. So influenced by the potential or current users. So when we are doing our actions, developing our interventions, thinking about how to um, develop some kind of programs which would change the outcomes of our target group, whatever it is. It's very important to look at how would they interact with other interventions, other actions, which are operating in our target setting. So what is currently operating there when I would like to implement my ideas? For example, I would like to increase physical activity of children. It's good, there is no doubt about it, and it's uh, ideal to increase physical activity uh, uh, outdoors, maybe not currently in Poland during the winter time due to the smog problem, but probably on average uh, uh, during the other periods of the year, yes. Well, let's look into the operating policies in some countries. So, for example, if I would like to stimulate children uh, in some regions of UK to play outside children, I will do all my efforts to uh, build their self-efficacy, build their confidence, their ability to scan the environment and see the places where they could perform their physical activity. Then they go outside. If I don't, did not account for the policies, what happens? They will see the information in the park. No ball games, no cycling, no dogs. And this is a children's, children's garden in Hackney. Right? So there is a clash between uh, what the operating interventions and policy are producing and my ideas. Uh, last year, I was on a conference in uh, Yokohama. And uh, we went for a walk in the uh, park, and actually that was one of the first signs that I have seen in the park in Japan. And it says, disruptive behavior is prohibited. This is disruptive behavior, and this is prohibited. So again, if my colleagues from Japan try to uh, develop the intervention which is enhancing physical activity of children in the open spaces, well, the children will see that this is a disruptive behavior and it's pro prohibited, actually. So there is a clash between what happens outside in terms of policies and what I'm doing. Then I'm having my fantastic papers and uh, because, as you know, I'm a renowned scientist, as Professor Grabowska has said. Um, well, uh, and I'm having very nice ideas and I know that it works and it works in Polish reality, so I go to the uh, president of uh, the city of Wrocław, uh, and I'm presenting her what could be done actually uh, in her city. She's very much orientated towards uh, health and society issues, so they are very happy to implement a lot of new programs. And I'm presenting what we could do and how we could do it and what is the evidence that it will work. And she says with her team, yes, we will think about it. Thank you for coming. And then she sends me an email. Dr. Lushinska. The stuff you presented is very interesting. But we like what we are doing so far. We like what we are doing so far. People like what we are doing very much. People like what we are doing. We would like to offer something more hip that you are offering, something more funny that we could display on our recently bought LED monitors in public transport. Uh, or please advise how to ask people to come over to uh, North Park for a dance tour tournament that we are organizing. Please advise. So she doesn't want anything that I am suggesting. She wants to use what she has already done. To use LCD monitors that she has recently bought. And she is in the middle of organizing a ma major tour uh, for people in North Park. And she wants me to enhance their actions that they are currently developing and providing. So, again, there is a certain clash between what I'm doing and what uh, she is doing. Um, what can we do? We could account for so-called dual processes. So we could think about different paradigms of different approaches compared to our current approaches, which, are, which we are predominantly using. Uh, for example, uh, 
we can think a bit more about very simple things which are referring rather to unconscious or implicit processes. And then they can be integrated much easier. So this is one of the other options that some people are working currently towards. So instead of, for example, the long uh, intervention, we have only the intervention which includes uh, of the visual images, images should not be visual, other than visual, of images which present uh, the figures which are very skinny and they are put near to the vending machine and then we expect and we have actually less people buying from this vending machine after those figures have been presented. This is something easy and can be combined into LCD monitors in Wrocław. Okay, we can use some techniques that we, are know, that we know that we are working and they are again based on this um, uh, implicit processes in terms, instead of uh, thoughtful, uh, for effortful techniques which require some conscious processing, uh, so we can do an attention training bias, for example, and again, there are some systematic reviews which say, well, those techniques should provide at least similar effect to these that we are uh, doing currently using uh, uh, effortful techniques. Okay, another way is, well, we think about many outcomes in our social or health life or individual life at the individual uh, level. So we don't think about the diets, whereas many behaviors actually are not individual behaviors. They happen in diets, right? So they are processes and they are interwing between what happens in the other persons in the diet in terms of their behavior. So we can try to um, do the interventions which are not targeting the inter individuals, but rather a diet mother and child, or a partner and a partner, and this way secure that the effects are larger. So this is an example of the study which, is, um, which we are doing. Unfortunately, it shows that it doesn't work very well, so it doesn't work better than the individual approach. Another option that some people are trying to pursue, and another paradigm that some people, some people are trying to pursue is so-called ecological momentary intervention. So instead of doing it in the traditional way. So approaching a group of target participants and delivering some lectures, some workshops over some period of time. We deliver the interventions many times during the day in a very small pieces. So we keep the participant very often reminded or occupied with the thoughts related to our intervention topic, but these are very brief uh, and very short uh, uh, batches of the, inter uh, of the intervention. Uh, well, does it work? The evidence is at least at the moment mixed, but this is an idea of a new paradigm. We have to wait for new, more research accumulating. Well, it seems that it may produce some kind of change. So this is the example. However, the long-term effects are, again, um, similarly poor. Uh, Okay, and the last thing that we can do, we can focus actually uh, a little bit more on a different thing, namely implementation theories and strategies. This is something that I would like to uh, conclude uh, with and say a little bit more about within the next uh, 10 minutes. So besides our theories which guide psychology or general social or behavioral research, um, we have also a group of our other theories from a scientific discipline which is called implementation science. Uh, and implementation science is uh, the scientific area which explains how the ways of delivering or providing uh, different kinds of actions in social sciences may be related to effects of this intervention. Okay, uh, one of the very nice systematic reviews produced by Rachel Tabak and her co-workers shows that there are at least 60 theories and frameworks which can inform implementation and uh, dissemination of your results. So if you would like to reach a broader group with your results, 
If you would like to make a difference with your results, not only by publishing the paper, but really inspiring somebody to take this up later and use it in practice, there are plenty of uh, frameworks and theories which could help you to do it. Uh, well, they have identified three top operational models, uh, which are actually the best in terms of the specification, very careful provide provision of details and providing step-by-step -step processes. So they are very straightforward and very informative as well. And those three are um, re-aim model, precede proceed model, and uh, Otava model. For those of you who are interested, I just really would like to suggest reading the systematic reviews and thinking how you could use implementation theories and combine them with your own research to achieve a different level. So achieve a uh, new way of explaining your results in a way which can be uh, securing uh, better and higher outcomes. I will focus on only one of those um, theories, of those 61, uh, on the model or the theory which is called REAIM. And this is a model, or other people would say this is a paradigm, which uh, says that whatever kind of research which is uh, targeting social or behavioral outcomes you are doing, you should actually think about how do you reach your target population? What do you actually do there that you usually do not disclose in your research? How do you implement the effectiveness, but not of your overall intervention, but of implementation strategies? So the ways that you have delivered the intervention. Was it talking? Was it multimedia? Uh, was it the uh, authority? Or was it a lay person similar to me? Uh, were the strategies that you have developed uh, adopted by your target staff, so the people that could potentially use your uh, intervention, were they adopted in setting or organization which is a target for your uh, intervention or for your um, action? Adopted means, well, let's say you have some, um, some uh, researchers who are delivering your intervention. Did they like it? Was it easy for them to learn it? Were they uh, really able to follow the instructions in a way which would be understandable for them? Uh, the next thing is called accounting for implementation costs, implementation consistency, and adaptations in the implementation processes. And the final is called strategies for maintenance. Did you choose any specific strategies which would secure that the effect that you want to achieve is maintained. Um, okay, and we have two um, large systematic reviews published last year by um, a large team where I was uh, co-author. It is uh, the team which was uh, operating in seven countries in Europe. And we tried to search for the conditions of implementation which would be the most successful. As a health psychologist, I was focused on health behavior change, so this is specific for diet and physical activity. However, you can see the list of the potential implementation strategies. Some of them would certainly uh, be relevant across different types of outcomes and across different target populations and pro programs, problems. Okay, uh, we have done, based on our review, a checklist. And this is a checklist of evidence-based implementation conditions. So uh, if you are develop, developing new um, research, new intervention, new action, uh, targeting any kind of social or health outcomes or, or well-being related outcomes, you can go through this checklist and at least think a little bit whether the ways you implement your actions, your intervention, uh, operated this way or the other way. Ideally, it would be good to report this also, so other researchers can gain the insight, well, whether those things that you have done behind the curtains, so to say, were really useful or not. Uh, importantly, I would like to say we have done it in the way which is state-of-the-art, but we did not only look for the research literature, we looked at the major stakeholders, so the major international organizations which combine practice uh, and research evidence to uh, propose certain policies or certain guidelines for, for practitioners. OK. 
okay? And using the REAIN model, having five areas of implementation conditions, we have identified, as I said, the number of conditions. As you see, there is a long list. There is plenty of conditions which could in, uh, actually influence uh, the effectiveness of your actions. We have come up with uh, some uh, examples here. So in terms of reach, if you are developing your intervention or your action or your clinical treatment, think about what strategies do you use to raise awareness of target behaviors and intervention? You go to the newspapers, how do you uh, try to convince your target population? Do you, uh, uh, where do you actually uh, provide information that such an intervention is available? So what strategies do you use to raise the awareness? Second, uh, do you use any incentives to participate? Please spell it out, what kind of incentives do you offer? Is it a, a credit course, for example, or is it any kind of financial bonus that the people can get? Uh, any other things that you use to uh, increase a participant's motivation? Do you have any resources for implementers, so the, for people who deliver, to invite and follow up participants? What are the resources for your practitioners, for your experimenters, to invite and follow up participants? Do you in any way uh, take into account cultural competencies of your intervention? So if you go for a, to, for example, people with uh, very low socioeconomic status and education, how do you actually uh, tailor your intervention in a way that it really suits their needs, their uh, current life aims, and their language uh, and their preferences? The next thing is related to effectiveness, but I'm not speaking about a kind of a general effectiveness of, uh, for example, psychological techniques. I'm speaking about effectiveness of implementation. So, for example, what is relevant for the effectiveness of uh, implementation? It's participants and implementers' satisfaction with implementation. Are your researchers, are your practitioners whom you, you are trying to convince to apply it uh, uh, in practice? Satisfied with this kind of intervention? Is it fun for them? Is it nice for them? Are they happy with that? Or it's just like another nuisance that they have to add to their full curriculum, right? Uh, next, is it feasible uh, among your providers uh, but also for the stakeholders. The stakeholders are the major organizations, uh, um, leadership in certain institutions. Is it feasible for them? So will they see it as fitting their current goals for the institution and the current needs of the organization? If you have any results, do you carefully disseminate them? To your stakeholders, so you should disseminate it not only to the participants, but also the directors, executives, uh, major stakeholders in the organizations when you are delivering your intervention. You take care of what you are doing. It. How are you doing it? The next thing is referring to adoption. For example, do you have training and regular meeting and communication with and between the implementers to secure that the actions, the intervention, the um, practice that you are developing are actually delivered? Do they get a regular feedback? Do they get a regular training? Um, do you do implementation planning with the stakeholders? Okay, you would like to actually translate your ideas into practice. You should Always go first and talk with the major stakeholders and plan for that with them, together with them, not only propose your own plan. That's my mistake, for example, that I have done with the uh, city president. I came with my own plan. Next, do you have an effective leader to secure the collaboration between implementers and organization involved? So, besides having the research leader, you have to have the implementation leader, which would take care of the, the actions that you are delivering 
are implemented in the, in the most successful way. Uh, next, do you have an implementation plan? So a kind of specific schedule in terms of when, where, and how you could actually deliver what you plan. Is your implementation strategy simple? If it's simple, then it's more likely that it will be understandable and acceptable. Uh, do you account for the complexities of various policies and their interrelations between what you are developing and your uh, and the existing uh, policies? Well, uh, do your target group has really time in the curriculum, in the current curriculum, to have this intervention, to have this program? Uh, is it there in community uh, or organization which is involved, but also what are the limitations of the time of your implementers? Uh, are your researchers, research assistants, uh, are your um, practitioners having enough time to learn about your intervention, to deliver it well? Well, always account for the costs of implementation, so not only for of developing the program that you are planning, but also how much it will actually cost to deliver it in the real world. Then you can discuss it with uh, major stakeholders because you will know what will they have to pay. And always think about um, accessibility or barriers for accessibility in the environment. So check carefully before you go outside with your intervention, whether the environment is really uh, matching the interventions. For example, in Colorado Springs, where uh, I have lived, um, we almost have no stairs. So the office is the ground floor, the house is the ground floor only, the supermarket is the ground floor. If you would like to invent the intervention which is targeting me using more steps, going the stairs, well, sorry. That will be very nice intervention for me, but I have no stairs, neither in my house, nor in my office, nor in any other facilities that I'm using. So it's completely not in line with what is going on in the environment. And the final thing, try to evaluate what actually uh, you are doing. What are your strategies or incentives for long-term participation? What do you offer to have no dropouts? over your intervention and to have people even, well, asking you to call afterwards to check up uh, what's going on. Do you and what strategies do you do to build the capacity to secure the maintenance? So for example, you would like to deploy your intervention later in a specific setting, you're preparing for that. Do you plan how the organization where you're planning to develop, uh, to, uh, to deploy your intervention uh, can secure that it can run the intervention later without you. So they can do it on their own. They will have sufficient resources in terms of thought, in terms of financial or any other types of resources. Okay, so the crisis uh, is a call for the new paradigm. Uh, we can use it, uh, we can solve the crisis using the new paradigms which are currently dominating such as in focusing on implicit processes, focusing on dyadic approach instead of individual approach, trying to use more ecological momentary interventions in terms of classical interventions which are in blocks. Or we can do the, a bit more using the parallel theories and parallel uh, investigating parallel strategies which are referring to implementation. Um, the last stage of the uh, scientific revolutions by Kuhn is the revolution stage, and it's actually well, open to you. So it's the time when you are selecting the new paradigm as a ruling paradigm, as a main paradigm, which can help us to explain a bit more. And this is called the paradigm shift. Uh, and because Social sciences are located in the use-inspired basic research quadrant, so the Pester quadrant. I do very strongly believe in the use-inspired. So therefore, for me, uh, the crucial thing uh, which could help us to revo revolutionize uh, the science and make it uh, a bit more uh, targeting the needs of our society would be to use implementation theories 
and uh, use implementation-related evidence-based techniques and mechanisms to improve the standards of our actions. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this wonderful, um, inspirational and thought-provoking presentation. And I think that you have already new paradigm shifts in your head. I want just to say this is very in line uh, what the European Commission is doing, lost in all the framework programs and its outcomes, uh, not even mentioning the recent one, Horizon 2020, which we all, all want to quest for. Uh, because European Commission created recently Joint Research Center, you can visit it also online, which is exactly in line with what Professor Ruszczynska um, has said, that we need uh, a, a kind of new approach to digest all the outcomes uh, of, of, of big research programs, even they are in consensus or there are many uncertainties or research gaps um, among them. Uh, the other initiative, more grassroots, is EU Policy Lab. Again, with this, uh, uh, with this approach, uh, what Professor Wyszczynska has offered to us. So I think that you are uh, 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 tempting uh, for uh, questions to our wonderful guests uh, of this evening. So the floor is yours. I will circulate the mic, please. I wanted to, um, maybe it's a comment, maybe it's a question, I don't know, um, I'm not sure. Um, my impression is that uh, even though the researchers, especially in the applied field, they, they know that we need the revolution uh, right now because the, the theories do not fit uh, the real-life interventions um, in certain populations, probably in all areas. Um, but my question is, like, um, w what's your impression or advice is on um, on the scholars who are looking from a different perspective and they're not very keen on uh, on changing the paradigms and uh, and those kind of revolutions? Well, my comment is the easiest way is to use the current paradigm, which is actually not taking into account. Uh, what the implementation sciences are saying and what the society needs currently are, to some degree, I would say. Yes, so just following the kind of a standard RCT design with experimental, of, um, experimental manipulation for a kind of a general population. Um, however, if you look at the funding bodies, international funding bodies, as Professor Grabowska has said, the European major funding bodies are very basic research national science foundation. So the U.S. organization which is funding basic research in science uh, in the U.S. STEM sciences, physics, theoretical physics, uh, basic chemistry research, and so on and so on. Half of the percentage of the evaluation of your project is the future social impact of your studies. They force the researchers Think about how your basic research may have a potential to have an impact on the society. So it comes actually currently from the major, large, major granting bodies uh, in the US, in Europe. Uh, think, even if you are doing absolutely basic research, how in future it can translate into some progress in your society. So, um, one of my suggestions would be go up and look for these major funding bodies and look the criteria for evaluation of your funding. If you would like in future to have a splendid career with major international grants, you have to think how your basic research, even really basic research actually, will have an impact on society. This is one of the ways to do it. Okay. Thank you, this was very inspiring. Uh, I also have, I think, a comment or rather an impression that uh, this revolution that you mentioned doesn't even, well, it calls for a new paradigm, but it seems to me that it also calls for new kind of scientists, really. Because if we, we sort of have to like come out of this bubble where we think in academic terms, even if we do this, use inspired research, that actually requires also interpersonal skills that you actually, as with your meeting with the distress of person, that you actually had to, well, uh, establish this rapport to actually achieve something. 
And I think this is also that something that we are maybe not taught or we very often forget that you actually have to be in touch with the reality to say it or like not really get offended. You mentioned at the beginning of your lecture that, for example, we need to consider the government even if we don't like it or like even if we don't like Donald Trump because this is something that is there and we have to like align in order to achieve that. I hope you agree. <laughs> Well, I think that uh, uh, STEM uh, sciences uh, actually uh, are in touch with reality pretty well. So even if they are basic sciences, they understand for a couple of decades, but they have to work with a team which includes also engineers and uh, other people who will translate their findings later into some kind of a middle stage product that can be potentially later implemented on the larger scale. I think. Social sciences are starting to understand it as well. Uh, many social scientists across the world, but we cannot do our very narrow discipline without the contact with the other types of sciences, which are social, other social sciences, or maybe also outside of social sciences, if you mean any kind of economists, but also any kind of health scientists would be relevant. So we are starting to see that. Uh, and I would say, well, let's take a good example from our big brother, the STEM sciences, who know and actually implement it for quite some time, and they uh, offer some kind of product which can be, has a, have a potential to be relevant for the society. And I think many social sciences are, well, just destined to work together with uh, different kinds of stakeholders, so not only our target population, but also uh, those who develop the, uh, those who uh, actually deliver the intervention, and uh, a variety of major organizations, NGOs, and policymakers, regional policymakers, and the top policymakers. We have a lot of instruments, uh, and we just need a, a little bit of thinking how to use them also outside to have a better sample, <laughs> to have also uh, longer, longer term follow ups, perhaps and to try to uh, also make an impact uh, in the real world. Thanks. I also want to say thank you for your lecture. I found a few inspirations for myself too. One is that I'm planning an intervention in a hospital. And for some reason, I, till now, I didn't think about whether the hospital will be able to conduct the potential intervention by itself. But I will now, so thank you for that. But just a question concerning Thomas Kuhn. I'm, I'm not a psychologist and not a social scientist, but why do you need Thomas Kuhn's text, Thomas Kuhn's model, actually his paradigm, as a paradigm for you are suggesting? What I mean is that I, I quite agree right, with the necessity of, let's say, extending implementation power of any any branch of what is called science, right? And this is what you are very rightly and strongly propagating. To what extent is this extension of the power of, 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 of a science a revolution? Right? To, or to what extent is it simply, simply a change or a, a enrichment, improvement, development of the old existing paradigm and not really a paradigm shift as yet? Because what Kuhn conceived of as a shift of paradigm was really a radical change from when one paradigm could not recognize the old paradigm as its own paradigm. Right? And here, here it's sort of it's this nice sort of background showing the nice round process of change, but I don't think it, it, it fully fits into your, into, into your tasks. Okay, thank you. Um... Probably I will have to agree that I did not reach completely the stage of the revolution where I say, well, this is a new paradigm, the old paradigm is abolished. What I have proposed is combining two paradigms in a parallel way, so using a kind of traditional paradigm that we are currently employing in the social sciences, uh, uh, combining it with implementation sciences paradigms uh, to uh, achieve the goals um, which we are pursuing in terms of explaining and changing uh, people's behavior. So 
perhaps it's not the stage of the revolution yet, it's just at the doorstep of the revolution. Uh, why I have not moved it into the revolution, say, well, let's use only implementation theories uh, in the uh, behavior sciences, for example. Well, I think we don't have enough evidence yet, so we are close in the close closer rather to the crisis stage or the end of the crisis stage. Uh, and maybe I'm a little bit myself anxious to say, well, let's quit completely the old paradigm and move towards the new paradigms. So, uh, yeah, maybe I'm just trying to convince myself, uh, well, it, are we ready for the new paradigm, uh, as Kuhn as cool proposes, uh, or we can try to test some alternative paradigms or some new paradigms and then uh, completely use them uh, uh, instead of current paradigms. So that's my response. Thank you. Do you have any practical example uh, of your intervention that impacted uh, the real world? Because this is the process, I assume, and that would be interesting to, to, to hear. If yes, you so what we, are, what we are doing currently is, uh, well, we are doing it, as I said, as a parallel. So we are using the interventions which are kind of the traditional interventions combining uh, the strategies which are based, for example, on self-efficacy and planning. But in the same time, uh, we, I would say, deliver the intervention to the um, experimenters mm -hmm. in our study and practitioners who are helping us, and also to the stakeholders. So, the, for example, uh, leadership in the organizations which, where we are doing, informing them also, so not only our target uh, population, but them also, raising the awareness and doing the intervention for them, which will help them to sustain this intervention over time after we have finished. Um, I, I will not have time to go into details, but um, we have currently a project which is called uh, Active Nadiade, Active Diets. If you go to the website activenediata.pl, uh, then you will sa find some more details about, for example, our current intervention, which is targeting um, uh, enhancement and uh, engaging into physical activity in diets, so in parent-child diets or partner-partner diets. Sorry that this is re relatively general, uh, but what I think what is the key is I'm not only delivering the intervention to my target person, so not to mother and child only, but also to the practitioners about how to deliver successful intervention, also to the stakeholders, so to the leadership of the organizations when, when we are developing the intervention. And also, we are working close with the city, so the city is interested in... Uh, uh, actually building this intervention in to their other programs that they are currently uh, developing. So the dance tournament and the other things became also as relevant as our intervention from the point of view and the perspective of the city. So it goes at, to se at several uh, layers. Yeah. I also want to say that, for example, in states, we can see some implementations of some interventions in just the natural environment. For example, there was some kind of a program in museums in New York, and there was a sign with a, with a statement that, please um, burn calories, not the electricity. And this sign was just uh, trying to motivate people to take the stairs. Do you see some kind of... Uh, interventions in Poland, I don't know, maybe implemented by the government or something? Uh, well, yes, I think uh, what is happening in many cities, so the level of local government, so not at the level of the uh, national government, but at the level of lo local government in many cities. Uh, well, I can give you the example of Rotswa, for example where the local authorities are coming up with many ideas taken from uh, mostly American uh, solutions, uh, trying to enhance healthy lifestyle. Uh, so, for example, as I said, offering the 
intense tournaments for seniors uh, in the parks, for example, where they can win uh, very nice prizes, and uh, they also are broadcasted on the local TV, for example. So uh, they get many kinds of enhancement and uh, positive reinforcement uh, uh, via this. Uh, so there are such simple things which are used uh, also by the local government. However, the evaluation of the effectiveness and the long-term implementation and sustainability is a problem. So these are the things uh, that many of uh, local governments not think and act just on the one-time action uh, or for a short time period. So um, I think this is another challenge how to talk to the local government think about the problems which could be implemented because they over longer time periods are uh, unsustained over longer time periods because for example they are not very uh, res requiring a lot of resources in very simple and alternative ways. Rotswaf wasn't uh, interested in listening or implementing. <laughs> I was just curious. Okay. One, one idea. Well, uh, then I will go back to the program that I have been just talking about, so active Nadiada. So, um, well, uh, instead of going to them and saying, well, listen, we are running the program where the, where the uh, citizens of, uh, or inhabitants of Wrocław could gain uh, a little bit more information about their physical activity, improve their physical activity, we suggest as well, we can offer the training for the city employees about, um, uh, well, the strategies to enhance physical activity that they could use in their own health promotion programs, right? And uh, then we combined it with example of our own program, which they found very attractive then because it used a lot of components that they are using, but not, for example, in the kind of a systematic way. So then they started advertising our program without... Um, our, so to say, uh, uh, queries and emails and so on, because, uh, well, they have started to see it as their own, right? But I think the main thing was not just us going to them and saying, well, hey, this is a nice program that we would like you to adopt. And we said, well, we would like to propose some workshops for you, uh, which may be helpful to develop you better programs that you're planning to do yourself with your own resources, which you actually don't know very well. But maybe there will be something useful. Okay? Thank you. Okay, so I will stand for my own health. Okay. Because uh, I'm Sitting sorry for is my English. Sitting is the new smoking, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excuse me again. Sitting is the new smoking, yeah, so yeah, you should stand up, of right. course. Uh, and sorry for my language, I'm kind of tired sitting all day, but again, uh, maybe I will address to your lecture, by the way, thank you for it, by a short commentary and a question at the end. First of all, uh, that's funny thing that my colleague mentioned the sign about burning calories, not the electricity. Uh, I'm in the field of an environmental psychology and I'm really interested in behavioral interventions to change simple behaviors such as using the prompts, like simple signs. And it, and it was kind of funny that you mentioned on your slides the prohibition signs in the parks. But the funny thing is that most of these signs are not effective as we can think. Well, most of the research shows that uh, basically we can get only the reactants after using these signs. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of funny thought to think whether using of these signs could uh, interrupt other techniques that you mentioned in health behavior. And on the other hand, as I'm thinking about my appliances and applying my uh, research to practice, as I was uh, currently trying to work with Lassimieske in Warsaw, uh, well, I get to this barrier where I planned my uh, studies and I showed them what they can do what they can apply to they and their uh, parks. And they were like, well, we don't think it's going to work. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Maybe next time. Mm -hmm. Or on the other hand, we don't have any money for you. Yeah. Because applying mm -hmm. my uh, research technique and like intervention was kind of costly. So that was the second barrier. And the question is, what 
can we do as young scientists to like well yes uh, I think you're doing the same mistake that as many of us yeah. are doing it as I was doing myself um, uh, as well uh, well the implementation science would say we'll start from a different point so go to them and talk about the resources that they have the procedures that are in place the re uh, resources I don't mean only financial resources but the human resources and skills and the knowledge that they have uh, well, the current programs that they run, the things that they think are hip and fun, and then the things that they think are important, and then search, scan your goals, and select those that are comparable with what they are currently uh, having in place as their own program, and they perceive it as their own. So this way, uh, you can actually secure better sustainability if you will be able to... Uh, get a joint program, then if they have resources for that already in place, you have to know it earlier, so you have to talk to them about it, then before you present something, so instead of presenting something or starting with presenting something, you should actually first ask them, what they are their goals, what are their current main needs, or the long-term goals that they would like to achieve, and the resources that they are using, and the skills that they are using. And then, uh, okay, so, one of the things would be this, this, this would require such and such resources. And I can try to develop something which will reach my targets and also the requirements. Uh, if, uh, after a couple of meetings, they uh, finally agreed to have some kind of uh, co cooperation with you. So, yeah, maybe I will <laughs> use the things that you've mentioned in your lecture. Good luck. So thank you. Thanks. Keep us informed about your outcomes. <laughs> Any more questions, comments, controversies, teasers? I have one comment uh, referring to, to the discussion, to, to the question that colleague had. I think that we are missing one point. We don't talk about need. Uh, what is the real need? Because if we, if we do our researches, yeah. nobody cares about it. Yeah. What of it if some students doing some PhD studies and so want to get the, the title? That's not the benefit for the real business and real world. So the starting point from my perspective, just to giving you advice from the business point of view, because I'm coming from the business, start to ask question, what do you need? Yeah. Because I'm doing some researchers, but maybe my researchers are not well, relevant to what, to, to what you need. Yes, and this is the, the massive mistake that yes. we do, yes. coming as you called young. I'm not young, so it's easier to talk. No, 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 it's, it's not, but <laughs> I'm not young scientist. I, I came here from business side, so if I listen to that kind of conversation, that's my first point coming to my mind. Uh, what is the real business need that we can impact? And yes, or this is the point yeah. that somebody who has the money can be influenced by. The rest is just talking, and this is what we do right now. Uh, yes, but I think that point was actually pretty much raised in my talk, at least. I would I try to, and I would like to once again enhance it. So, what are the goals of your stakeholders, right? And the stakeholders, I would say, it's not only the leadership in the organization, but this is also the personnel who works in this organization and who will be implemented in practice, which you are doing in future. So, uh, one is the bosses one level and the needs of the bosses and the goals of the bosses. Then there are the needs and the goals of your coworkers or the coworkers or the personnel or the employees of the organization. And then if there is any other target population for this organization, what are their needs and their goals? And how your intervention or your action feeds the needs of these three target groups, right? So leadership, those who will implement what you are doing are the personnel who will actually do it on a daily basis. Then the target population. Another barrier that popped in my mind is like uh, we as PhD students are usually alone. <laughs> I don't find in Poland a lot of group of research groups uh, within psychology PhD students. For example, I'm working with myself and my, of course, uh, promoter. But that's not enough for me. 
as I think about my research programs. Yes. And I do as much as I can do, but still I'm thinking, I, I like, I need a team. I need a team of my colleagues. Like, hi guys. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, this is a kind of a general open question, which direction the science and the uh, uh, doctoral education is going towards uh, many countries, developed countries, you are not working alone on your thesis, you are working as a part of a larger program or a larger project when usually you not only uh, fit your needs but the needs of your colleagues and the skills of your colleagues and the competences of your colleagues and also ideally the needs of the societal target group and the organization in future, hope to implement something. So I can just, well, if you are not in a, such a situation currently, but lucky enough, then indeed, uh, this is one of the opportunities. So uh, Professor Grabowska and uh, the doctoral students are interested in doing something important, not only having their PhD, but doing something important. So maybe uh, try to find somebody from your colleagues or joining the lab, at least for the internship abroad for half a year, and get this kind of experience as well. Exactly, I would like to follow up on that because now we are at the stage of um, the, the, the early stage of uh, commencing uh, the new umbrella uh, kind of strategy about labs and hub of university, of our university. So please also orientate yourself, what kind of labs are available uh, at our university? which domains they are covering, which to what topics they research, what kind of groups they are. Maybe you can join them, if not on regular basis yet, as uh, uh, scholarships or, or other kinds of researchers, just on voluntary basis to learn from the others. But formal learning and informal learning, that's what we are going to pursue and also develop the do doctoral program uh, further. So we have a rector here, uh, he can confirm that this is the strategy of our university. And we want to also attach the doctoral program much more to the research groups and, and, and labs uh, which are available at our university, but also give you more instruments to, um, to also go abroad or to other, not only abroad, but also in Poland, to other lab in Poland, because internal mobility between um, scientific institutions in Poland is very low. We perceive mobility uh, only internationally, mostly. So also, please find your way. And this Vitae organization I mentioned, uh, please subscribe. Please learn more. This is about practice and research nexus there, about your career planning, about continuing your postdoctoral uh, post career outside academia, because not everybody needs to pursue academic career, of course. So we will give you much more instruments to guide you um, through this uh, uh, world, which is very competitive and, uh, um, and where we need to combine both research and practice, which is not easy at all. So we have final, final few minutes for last questions, comments, um, suggestions, whatever. Please take your, your opportunity because it won't come up quickly. <laughs> Well, if you don't have any questions now, then I can also offer, you can always contact me via email and uh, refer to this meeting because uh, I was invited to give this talk, but I am currently your professor at the moment, so I am at your uh, services at the moment. Uh, just email me if you have any specific questions, and I'm happy to try to uh, do my best to answer and provide you with any resources on it. And I can give you a boost because Polish uh, uh, students at every level hesitate to write uh, all the uh, famous professors. Go on, move on, write whoever you like. It might be unanswered, your email, yes? But maybe this professor of world, world famous professor will answer you. You never know, but give yourself a try, really. I, I, uh, there is a differences of courage, of this scientific courage between Polish students or maybe Central and Eastern European students, Western students, Central and Eastern European students hesitate a lot, while Dutch, British uh, uh, students 
write, write your、uh, the, the 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 leading authors of your discipline. Why not? I'm getting an email from Chinese、uh, students and postdoctoral students every other day. Exactly.、Example. Give yourself a try. Without trials, won't be errors. Yeah. This is this is learning, and networking and everything. What is mentoring in science also, also about? So again, thank you so much for your time, for being with us, for sharing.、Thanks. Good luck.